more and more RVs are coming with residential fridge. Is that right Sorry, there? I didn't know what you were doing. Go ahead. Let's see. <laughs> Keep your finger down. More and more RVs are coming included with residential fridges, which are awesome. But the question is, how long can you camp without being hooked up with a residential fridge on board? And not only that, could a DIY lithium battery setup help you be able to do that longer? The answer might surprise you. We're Marissa, Nathan, Hensley, and JJ. We sold our house in 2015 and moved into an RV full time to live a life of less junk, more journey. Life is a journey. Let go and get going. And so we're on our way back from Ohio, picking up this new RV <laughs> uh, on the way back to Tennessee. And, and usually we're like, well, let's maybe we can stay at a Walmart or maybe we'll stay at a Boondockers Welcome or a Harvest Host. And I started doing the math and I started thinking about the residential fridge and especially the residential fridge in our open range we, we sold, like they use a lot of power. And worse yet, if you're staying somewhere without hookups and it's cold, if you watch that video, it's kind of like a blizzard. <laughs> You've also got to run your propane furnace, which is propane, but it uses your battery power to run the fan, um, to kick on, to kick off, all that kind of stuff. We're so used to having the lithium batteries to help us do that, and we just didn't didn't feel comfortable just overnighting at a Walmart without that security of having the lithium battery power overnight. So we got back and we're like, you know what? We need to do something. <laughs> and better yet, our friends Mike and Leanna with the Dry Campers, um, they were coming in the area doing installs and they do a ton of installs. But I, I talked to them and said, guys, why don't we just do a, um, a DIY install? So this is not gonna be like a 10, 20, $30,000 lithium install or with solar and the whole deal or anything like that. This is a $2,000-ish install that you could probably do yourself. And if you have any of the same fears we have um, about the fridge or about these things that are going on, uh, it could really, it's just, it's just comforting to know that you've got that going on and you don't have to worry about those things. This may be good to you guys, you probably, don't want to see my ugly face anymore, but you're gonna to get to see another beautiful face this video. Mike from the Dry Campers, uh, they, they're in a 34 foot Airstream triple axle suite. But the thing is today, even though I've got Mike with me, this is a DIY install. If you are thinking about dipping your toes in lithium, if you think you may have some of the issues we've talked about, this install is gonna be probably the easiest lithium install video. <laughs> well, it's a drop in. You ready to get started? Yeah, let's do it. So here's the entire package that we're putting in today. Two 100 amp Battleborn batteries. We got the BMV 712, which will show us the status of the Battleborn batteries. And then down here's the converter that we're swapping out with the original converter that's in the RV. Probably one question a lot of people have is, can you use the existing converter with the lithium batteries? Um, can you? Yes. Should you? Probably not. Tell us the science behind why you shouldn't use that though. Okay. When it charges a lead acid battery, it has to charge much slower because they will overheat and could possibly potentially explode. So the power coming out of the converter, yes, it's 55 amp, but it's given to it in short bursts that's super slow. With a lithium battery, you can give it as much power as you could possibly give it, and then it will, you know, take all of that power um, in bulk charge. So what you're saying is this one is going to charge a lithium battery way slower. Days. Than, days slower. <laughs> days slower. It, so it, can it do it? Yes. Should you do it? No. Probably. Well, no, because as soon as you charge your batteries out, then it's going to take you days to recover. Um, the lithium batteries are half the weight, twice the power. So we're essentially making this battery bank for of the lead acid batteries. So four times longer is going to take days with that charger to charge. So what's first, Mike? We so, put our um, tongue to the two terminals that are live and then we... You gotta take your shoes off and be standing in water first. <laughs> That's the key. You gotta have bare feet. Tools needed, very simple. Um, I use uh, kind of a multi-tool screwdriver that's not just a screwdriver. Uh, that's a half-inch nut driver. By the way, check out this bay. Like, here's the door. Look, at, uh, look it's crazy. <laughs> uh, got plenty of room. I can stretch. This is going to be my new apartment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so for our install today, we're going to keep these two up front later on if we do add on to these batteries. And that's also something really cool about the lithium. If you're adding on lead acid, you probably don't want to wait 6, 12, 18 months to add those on because they're going to be significantly 
deader <laughs> than the other ones as far as matching them up. But if like if we want to put two of these in today, later on we have had two more, four more, whatever we're going to do because we are going to beef this up with solar and some other stuff later. But there's no fear in going ahead and doing these two now. And then if we decide to do more later, we can just do more later because these have a, what, like an eight, 10 year warranty? Like So it's 100% for eight years and then prorated for the last two years. So overall 10 year warranty on batteries is just amazing. So you got a while if you decide to add yes. some batteries on. You can just add them on and it's not gonna matter. So these are my extra fingers and hands. So basically if I wanna get something out of the way and I'm just gonna stick it up here and zip tie it to keep it up out of the way. Most battery terminals are gonna be half inch. So, um, did you yeah. turn off a disconnect or anything before this? Mm -mm. Okay. Nope. Just a side note as I edit this, uh, Mike has done hundreds of these installs like lithium and solar and security systems, all kinds of electrical experience. He is super comfortable doing this with the power on. It's easier and faster for him. It's more convenient for the customer. Uh, if you're anything like me, and if you are uncomfortable or unsure of your skills as far as this, feel free to disconnect the batteries, disconnect the shore power, make sure everything is off and then you won't have to worry about it. Zip tie this out of the way so that it doesn't touch the frame. If this touches the frame, there's still power on it because of the uh, converter. So. Is this gonna be the toughest install you've done this year? Uh, the most time consuming by far. <laughs> it's just because of filming though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. Okay, that's true. I, think... I have to brace myself. So these are 55-ish uh, pounds a piece, and then the Battleborns are 31 pounds a piece. Another good pro of the DIY package is that if you do change rigs, you just take these batteries with you, just swap them over. It's not that hard to swap them to whatever rig you're buying, and then you take the batteries from the other rig, swap them back to this rig. Um, it's not that big a deal to swap this around versus, you know, you get into the panels and everything. It's more of a permanent install on the roof. I mean, for us, we've never tried to take the panels with us. I mean, once they're on there, they're on there. You're doing a DIY and you're putting your batteries fill in the blank space um, and the batteries are hard to get to or the terminals are hard to get to and you already have your terminal ready if you put the the ring terminal on it and pull this that bolts not going anywhere so now I can one-handed put the rest of the stuff on it with the tension that I'm providing for my other hand. So what Mike's doing now is his OCD. You basically don't have to do this. You can, <laughs> you can actually just be done right now. They're dropped in and connect them, but Mike wants it to look clean. Yes. Uh, that's part of what he does with dry campers. So yes. he is going to feed all this through here, make it look nice and neat. So yeah, sort of up to you. <laughs> how, much, how much time you want to spend on making this look clean? It is gonna look way better. Now at the core of this DIY install, and this is why this is becoming more and more essential as time has gone on, because as we've started to see more and more residential appliances, and yet as we've seen the battery banks stay the same for the most part on a lot of RVs, you're starting to have the problem of just making it one night <laughs> at a Boondockers Welcome or a Harvest Host or a Walmart, like it can be kind of tricky. Lithium is gonna give you that extra oomph or boost that really, for a residential package is needed for those things to run like they need to when you're not plugged up, even if it's just for one night. Now, long-term, if we add on to this and do more batteries, we're probably actually gonna take these to the middle of the rig, sort of like we did with our open range, where they're gonna have a little more of a heat controlled environment and it'd be like zero issues. And you may be thinking, oh, Nathan, you shouldn't be installing these in your front bay. It's not temperature controlled. Well, I mean, really nothing even happens until it drops below 25 degrees. The Battleborn did like a white paper on lead acid versus these lithiums uh, and you can I'll put a link in the description below you can check that out if you want to but these actually perform better than the lead acid batteries and <laughs> in cold weather and <laughs> they're actually probably a little bit safer because these batteries once it starts getting super cold the BMS it just it cuts it off it says look I don't want you to put any more charge in here the lead acids is just like yeah just just keep it coming just keep charging it uh, because they do still work b below 25 degrees but the BMS just tells it look, let's not just, let's not keep charging it at 25 degrees. You have plenty of options. If you want to do plug and play, you could probably put like a little, little heat lamp in here or something like that if you wanted to. I don't know about you guys, but like I'm trying not to be in sub 25 degree weather super often if possible and rely on my lithium batteries at the same time. So why would anybody want a residential fridge over like a typical propane slash electric fridge that you see in a lot of RVs? Our resident ex expert Marissa is going to tell us, um, <laughs> no, why do you want it? Honestly, I love the space. The space is great. It's just, I don't know about you guys. I'm going to tell you what my biggest fears are right now. And this is legit. My biggest fears are B 
being cold and being hungry when I'm RVing. <laughs> I'm always afraid, are we gonna be warm enough? Are the kids gonna be warm enough? Can we boondock overnight? Do we have the power for that to stay warm? And I have this fear because I think it happened one time a few years ago in the Airstream staying in a national park and realized we ran out of food and a grocery store was like an hour, hour and a half away. Well, she's, she <laughs> and, says we ran out of food. Like, we had food. No, I had ran out of food because we didn't have as much fridge storage or storage space. And then I think from then on, I've just been afraid to be stranded out an hour, hour and a half from a grocery store and realize we didn't have enough food. And so the the fridge has just given me that security to know that, hey, I can stay in a national park, have all these food options besides the space. And honestly, I just love the look of it. I love that it gives it the extra homey feel. And for me living in this RV, I love that it makes it feel like home. My list is long and super elaborate. Um, it's one thing. I do not have to manually defrost this thing. It has an auto defrost setting. It does it on its own. Oh, and it makes Marissa happy. So I like that too. <laughs> so Mike's going to explain how to wire these up because you do want to wire them a certain way, especially once you start getting what, two, three, four, five, six batteries. Yes. And you're going to do like a lot of drain on this first battery. Right. This is the first battery. It's the path of least resistance. This battery is going to drain faster than the other battery and it's going to wear out faster, especially for lead acid. So what you can do in, in a multi, multiple battery setup, from two batteries to as many as you have, you pull the negative terminal off of one battery, the first battery, and then you pull the positive terminal off of the last battery. And all of the stuff comes from here. It comes up through here and goes over and then goes to the rig. Negative terminal on this battery, it ends. It's only on that one post. It comes over here and comes and junctions here and then I put a, a larger wire on it because we're going to add a 712. Uh, it doesn't have to be this big, but this is just what I use. Um, and then this this will go to the 712 shunt. And then out of the 712 shunt, we'll connect the rest of the RV. That way, so that any power that leaves the battery bank has to go through the 712 so that we can monitor what's going on. Everything factory is fine as long as you don't have a big inverter. So if and we've got, I think about a 1500 watt, I think with our fridge, probably something right. like that. So which this, is fine. That's not big. When you say big, like what? 3000, 2000 and above, you 2, need, to, above. You need okay. to make this bigger. Okay. So typically if you've only got an inverter for a fridge, you're probably okay. That's not going to be big, right? But no. an inverter for the whole rig or something like that, right. it's going to be bigger. So you reused everything that was here yes. other than what you're going to use for the shunt. This, this is this cool. reused as well? Yes. Okay. Yep. So Mike is now wiring up the BMV 712 over here. That's what this shunt is up at the top. So your power coming off your negative side of your battery bank uh -huh. comes up and goes to battery only, goes through the shunt, which that's where the measurement takes place. And then these were the existing negative wires that were connected to the original batteries. So now if you'll hand me the box, I can plug it in. There you go. See, I do pretty much everything around here. <laughs> Mike doesn't think I'm very funny. <laughs> He's like, <laughs> Everything works properly because we automatically go into program mode. Bluetooth. And he's saying our bay is not metal. Yeah, so it's not metal. So if we want to, we can just leave it in here mm -hmm. and just connect everything yep. to the top. Well, still, it's just it's just cool because it's Bluetooth. Because that if oh, you yeah. want, you know, if you want to run this all the way up and have this, you know, up front with our other stuff, we could. Mm -hmm. Or you can just leave it in here and Bluetooth to it. So one of the questions that um, I have been asked in the past is how tight do you tighten like all the cables and, you know, your connections onto your... Um, you know, your shunt and stuff like that. Basically, you want it tight enough till you can't move it. So when the terminal won't slide on the terminal block, including on the batteries, you can't move the terminals, then that's how, that's the minimum tight that you want to be. Maybe just a little bit more than that, but not so much that you're like stripping the, the bolts or, um, you know, really torquing down on this. turning on so right now what it's doing is um, 
it is putting 32 amps of power back into the batteries. Once this drops down to where it's, it's a positive number, positive number means it's charging, a negative number means that you're drawing from the bank. This is good too, because you can kind of go in the RV, turn things off and on, and you can start to see what kind of draw things are pulling out of here. Yes, so now that you have this in place, you could literally go ahead and shut shore power off, uh -huh. turn the fridge inverter on, uh -huh. and know exactly how much power your fridge pulls. The fridge is, is not running yet because we're only drawing 13, 14 amps, it, it bounces a little bit. But like I was saying, a negative number shows what you're drawing off of your battery bank. We're opening everything up, trying to get the fridge to kick on. Ooh, that thing's really efficient. Or... <laughs> this whole video has been about how inefficient the fridge is, and now it's like, so it looks like the resting rate of the RV with the fridge um, kicking on and everything, because I lowered the temp, is somewhere between, um, I don't know, 15 and 22, something like that. So what we're doing now is we've turned off pretty much all the lights in the RV. Fridge is still on with the inverter. These are just all experiments if you're curious, like how much power is my RV pulling off of the batteries? You can start to see all that. Whereas before, all we really have is this, low and medium and high and two thirds, pretty much. Push on and off. Okay, all right. Fridge, fridge is off. All right, there's our, yeah, that's there's it. There's parasitic draw. So the RV is only pulling 2.11 with all the lights off, the inverter off. Just the most surprising thing in this whole video, ironically, <laughs> is that our other fridge was an absolute power hog when it came to residential fridges in an RV. Like it was 8.5 amps is what the fridge was. But the thing that's surprising about this fridge, the other one was 8.5. And it was a Frigidaire. This one is only 3 amps. So this one's a third smaller as far as the size but it's almost three times as efficient as far as what it's pulling on power. But even though this refrigerator is more efficient than the other refrigerator, it's still gonna pull 50, 60 amps overnight, uh, which is close to what you would use if you got an 80 amp battery, it's still gonna almost use the whole battery and then you add lights on top of that or if you have a blower for the heat, you know, the whole thing we talked about at the beginning, you're still there where you need more battery power. But with our other fridge, we really <laughs> needed some battery power because that thing was pulling I don't know, 100 amps, give or take 10 amps overnight. So it's a bummer to have an 18 instead of a 26 on the fridge, but that, that's that's crazy efficient and it still looks good. It's still residential. I think if you get a residential fridge that's around a six amp draw, you're, you're, it's kind of like a straight swap for a lithium battery. So it's like, is it worth it to have the residential fridge? Oh, you got all the power usage, but then it's like, well, if you just put one more lithium battery into it, it kind of makes up for that residential fridge as far as the draw that is pulling at least that night, maybe part of the next day. I honestly don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I think it is a personal choice. It depends your style of camping. Mm -hmm. It depends what your comfort level is. Yeah, I think the big picture on a lot of it is don't get a residential fridge that's pulling 8.5 amps has 180 amp battery and say, I'm gonna go boondocking for multiple nights without mm -hmm. solar or generator or anything else going on because yeah. you it will drain you um, and it will kill that battery pretty fast. I oh, want another bonus. We shave 50 pounds of weight off the RV by swapping out those two batteries. So that's pretty cool. That's 50 pounds of clothes I can add. <laughs> <laughs> Priorities. Everything actually is underneath this couch inside our airstream. Three, and then the fourth one is over there. You can run the microwave for four hours and 45 minutes. That's a lot of microwaving. That is. <laughs> <laughs> microwave a turkey if you want it at that point. 